got a little show on down at the cafe, which has got a lot of early work from different periods um, uh, around the ocean, which seems pretty strange for someone who's been brought up in the country and most of my subject comes from the, the orchard where my dad grew up. But, but I think that that's the romantic side in me that I think because you're from the country, uh, going to the ocean, which we used to on holidays, often just for a week, a year or two weeks, uh, the mystery of it and almost the fear of it, uh, I was always so interested in. And, um, and I started to make boats, model ships when I was a kid, everything to do with ships. I mean, e even reading, which I didn't do much as a kid, I really didn't do any proper reading till I was 20, 21. But um, things like Robinson Crusoe and Robin Hood Stevenson's um, Treasure Island, like the themes in that, you know, the themes of treasure and lost islands. And, and, and I only think in this morning, I mean, Robinson Crusoe really sums up kind of all my work. It's kind of like the idea that you end up on an island and you have to build everything out of what's around you. I mean, I've done so much of that with my work. It's a, it's a way for inventing things and making your mind work in an imaginative way. So um, I built a lot of ships when I was a kid, all out of wood. You know, they weren't sort of kicks, they were from pitchers. Um, a lot of them I tried to actually sail in ponds, which was usually not successful. My mum would make all the sails, and um, I had quite a few of them. I ended up, when I got, you know, in your childhood, when a period ends, you make a big statement to get rid of things, you're moving on. I gave most of them to my cousins, and um, they pretty well wrecked them, but at the time it didn't matter. And the same happened later on with, uh, I made real boats, like canoes. And... Now, all of these were made when I was really quite young, like the boats, um, which I still have one, because my mother, my mother was wonderful, because when I was giving everything away, she said, you must not, you must keep one. And I've still got it. Okay, this is the only, this is the only model that I have left. And I, when I think about it, I started this probably when I was 13, definitely no older than 14, I was probably still making it. It's all made of balsa, and my mother said I just had to keep one and not give it away, so I've still got it, but hadn't been for her. Makes a powerful image here, I'd have to say, because spontaneously I've come and put it on, actually on top of my son's ashes. Up there. It looks absolutely beautiful there, but it's, it's with my um, son's spirit. But um, it's all carved out of balsa and handmade. And when you come up close, you know, you can see that a kid's made it. But that's probably what's quite nice about it. It's not something an adult model maker. It's not perfect. <laughs> but I'm so glad I've kept it. It's the only memory of a, of a ship I have from childhood. I've still actually got a couple of my model making books. And they're so English. Um, I think that... Or lots of boys and girls in the 50s in Australia had these sort of books that they were all from England and telling you how to make things out of wood that didn't exist here. It was always a mystery. It's like getting those Christmas cards with a little blue robin on it in the snow at Christmas when you're a kid and uh, you never really question it, but it's, it's weird. <laughs> so this is called Moral Making for Boys. Beautiful book. And I actually think I got this book when I was like, I'm talking about nine or ten, a junior teach yourself book. And um, I'll go to a page because it's still got the stains of glue because this is a, a model that I actually made. I made it a different scale, all out of wood, just from these plans to get things right. And um, in the front here, I actually still sign my name like this. I was very excited by doing an M like this, fancy M which I actually think just recently I looked at my, my mother has a birth cup and it's written on my birth cup, uh, a christening cup. Nine and sixpence it was because of course this was before dollars. This is really weird. So I've just found another book. It's called Things to Make and Do. Look at those lovely English children. Look, they're even making models and they've got their tie and shirt on. It's extraordinary. But inside the cover, and this hurts a little bit really because it's to do with my education. In the front cover, it's got Book Week 1962, 
when I'm at high school. So 62, what am I? I'm 12 years old. Um, first prize for an essay competition awarded to Merrick Fry in 1C Bathurst High School. So I would have been, I would have had to pick this book from the money I won. And to think that I went from that, left school when I was 15, and I actually failed in English at high school. So what I can say is that I didn't fail in English at high school. The education system failed to educate me. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture of one of the boats. I think that's the Arcady. That's the actual one that I showed you earlier, ah, the model. That's the actual oh, one. Oh, yeah, it is the too. Arcady. It is. <laughs> but boy, these books, they're amazing books. What would I have done without them? There wasn't the internet then. Yeah, it's <laughs> gorgeous. Yeah. I'm great you've still got it. I'm very lucky to have it. So the idea of the ocean, and even behind our place, there was a, 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 a little, well, the creek or a culvert. Uh, and um, you know, I didn't tell my parents, but I used to make these amazing little rafts. I didn't tell them because I knew it was dangerous. And I'd, you know, use canvas and old paint tins, put them all together, wait till there's a big storm and throw them in and jump on them, which was ridiculously dangerous, but, oh, terrific fun. And that was probably about the most adventurous I ever was to do with water. <laughs> and what does a boy do that dreams at school just about boats? Well, of course, I joined the Navy, which was an absolutely ridiculous thing to do, but... Um, it wasn't just about the sea. I think it was about getting out of town to leaving. The idea of seeing bigger things. Um, so joining the navy, which I was only in there for, I was only in there for about six, seven months and got out. But it made me learn really fast, and I was really surprised because there was all these sort of grey, terrible battleships and and lots of bully men about pushing me about. Um, my stories of cabin boys growing up on beautiful sailing ships on the ocean and uh, men weaving blankets and going ashore and getting gold and all that, it just didn't seem to fit with the modern navy. <laughs> uh, so um, I grew up very quickly. This is a work that you can see because I've still got it because obviously when you do something, you start to get to this scale, it's harder to sell. This is called Moon Boy. Now, Moon Boy, um, Sidney Nolan did a small painting of kind of a, it's basically a moon with a boy's face. It's a gorgeous little thing. So that's, I named it after that. And um, depending on your imagination, this is the eye and here's the boy's nose and mouth. So there's a kind of cartoon of a moon boy. But you know, I'm also playing games here when you come in close. There's actually a boy from the ocean because this is out of my ocean theme. So that there's lots of things, there's a double take, you know, it's a face, it's an ocean, um, it's even double-sided. When you go to the other side, there's another, a night theme with a moon. And down the bottom here, I've got this beautiful glow-in-the-dark um, octopus, which I've got from Trippic Scientific. Of course, this is a vase, and it's got a... And the boy goes, the boy here, the boy that's in the ocean, the ocean boy, has actually got even a little chain coming down, sitting on the bottom of the ocean. It's very exciting when you're making these things with all of these kind of little stories, because that's what you get excited about, making them. And they can't all be explained to people. People love it. They get it at their own level. So I still own this one. And... Um, yeah, it's gorgeous, man. <laughs> <laughs> what is the what is that? The chain is that a tea strainer yes. or something? Yes. Oh, very yeah. good. It's a tea strainer with a ball on it. Yes. <laughs> Can you see that? Yeah. Did you see it before that? No. No, I'm just see? looking at it, knowing you now, I can. Imagine. I have to say that I remember when I had my show. Uh, Tail Tailwind was the first show that I had down at Dank Street with things of the ocean and a lot of little boxes and I pretty well sold them all but that was the first one about the scene I had big drawings of the ocean I was reading at the time the, the, the book that um, Menzies wrote about the Chinese you know uh, 
going around the world in the first big ships before anybody else. And it's, people kind of still don't believe it, but a lot of it is true. They did go to a lot of places before anybody else in these massive Chinese junks. Zheng He was the famous um, captain. Um, and um, a lot of the things in the show were about that. So I had even things, I went to the foreshore in Sydney and did foreshore, big foreshore drawings. And then off the coast, I'd had Chinese junks. I was imagining that they could have went past there. But I'd have to say that most of my work is about a narrative. And this is interesting because when I was at art school, we, we had much more sort of uh, formalist teachers that were into abstraction. And they were trying to knock the narrative. They thought this was all very old fashioned. But it could never be knocked out of me. I couldn't see the point of, um, it just seems to me that that direction of, you, you have to start with uh, an inspiration to do something. It has to be a very personal inspiration. And uh, it doesn't matter what you make, if you're just making it to set certain aesthetic values and to follow in some historical footsteps of someone else, it, it makes no sense. So all my work starts with a narrative. And, and often I think with artists, there's actually only a couple of narratives in them. We often go back to the same themes, even the best artists. So if you look at my work, the first narrative comes out of me going to the orchards with eroded gullies, and I'll talk about that another day. And the second one is of my, almost the opposite, the longing to go to the ocean, which to me was mysterious because the ocean is frightening. It's so big and, um, and it, it's almost like, I almost joined the Navy because I was scared of the water, which sounds ridiculous. <laughs> At any rate. He thought that, you know, anything that had anything to do with subject was no good. And that's why a lot of that painting, we were even encouraged, you know, that you could just be a painter that just used red or a painter that just, like, the more, more specified you become. But see, what they thought is painting's finished and, you know, what else, what, how can we wring every drop? You know, historically it's all over which I've always found ridiculous because every age, we live in a different age and we respond to history differently. So I've always thought this was ridiculous. The moment I went to art school, they all tried to make us believe in this kind of formalism. And um, I was a bit older than the others and um, it, it, it didn't work for me. I, I, I could do it because I was clever and um, I did certain works, but they meant nothing to me after. And it wouldn't matter if people said they were terrific, you know, beautiful painting, but what the fuck if they, about what is the question? Totally, yeah. <laughs> Probably one of the first works I started to make using sort of more clearer materials, because this is well before I made the glass works. So here, I'm now looking at this, I realized that quite early on, I was using these transparent materials. And, of course, found objects have always been there. I mean, this would just be a bowl upside down here. But it's a green bowl. We've got that from the $2 shop, and it would have been this lovely plastic green. I love this green. Yeah. It comes from this chartreuse green. It reminds me of my mother. It was one of her favourite colours, and it runs a lot through my work. So even, even that, even a colour is not a, is not a sort of formalistic thing. Our feeling for colour and our palettes come from our, they come from our memories of childhood and the things we remember. The colours of certain things that meant a lot to us. I'm often surprised when I look at earlier works in my palette now that, that there, there's certain colours that I use and other certain colours I use in a very limited way. It, it's a personal, very much a personal thing. Your palette. Um, you notice this with a lot of which will come out often how much Cezanne's had an influence on me. But one of the problems with most of the people that, that have kind of tr tried to take stuff from Cezanne is they use his palette. And it's so obvious they're using his palette when they don't come from the Mediterranean, they're not Cezanne. I actually visited where he painted them and you can absolutely understand the palette. Uh, and there's certain works that I've made, like recent sculptures, where I've actually used to actually say this is about Cezanne. But if you're going to take ideas from Cezanne, you have to take them back to your own country and you have to, they have to filter through you 
and you take parts of them to develop into your own your own vision of the world and it's the it's the artist's individual um, vision of the world that's the most important thing and I'd have to say that most people actually don't find it most people spend their life under the cover of other artists and I don't know it's because they don't have a vision or they're not heroic enough to say this is my vision and I don't care what other people think but in the end that's what makes great individual art is a kind of new look at putting all those historical things together and again back to your own your, your your own experience in life, your in, which every one of us has a different experience of life, you know, the joys and sadness of life. Um, and this is terribly important because you know, I started with colours because colour is a very, means different things to different people. Hey. My friend Rod, who's a painter and a very good painter, and we'll we'll talk to him at some stage, I was being very open with him yesterday, saying that um, uh, I think that I used to be a much better enthusiastic talker about art and what it meant and, um, and that I was losing my edge, perhaps because I was, um, with, with the death of my son, that I, um, I felt damaged, I suppose. But, what he, what he felt was that he thought that that was not true, that perhaps I was, uh, because there was more doubt in the things I believed in and questioning of them, he thought that this, that perhaps I was even better, well, I don't know how good I was, but that the things I had to say were probably maybe even more important now because I had a, a slightly less egotistical view of them the things I believed in, you know, I was quite willing to undo some of them and rebuild them. And the doubt that was in there was quite a healthy thing. That, in a way, that as you get older, you get wiser. And um, but when wiser doesn't make you happier or more confident or uh, he, he, um, you've you've learnt a lot. Um, there's a cliche, isn't there, that, you know, it's, by the time you get to my age, you kind of, you've learnt so much, but you haven't, you haven't got the energy when you're young. You've got all the energy when you're young and all the ego, energy and willpower, uh, but you haven't got the wiseness. And then the, the, the trouble is, when we all get older, probably just before our death, we're probably the wisest, but uh, then we haven't got the energy to do. It's like, there, that is where life is really unfair. One should have another go at it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> With all that knowledge, don't you think? Yeah.